Hi, good morning, guys. Um, so it's nice to be here in New York. Uh, I live in California now, but I'm here for a couple days. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about, um, well, I, th I, think there's this, uh, I think there's this kind of myth that's perpetrated often, which is this myth of consistency, uh, that it's really important to be consistent. And I, I think you hear this a lot, like if you go to art school or something and you talk to your professors and they tell you the one thing you should do is like find one thing and that no one else is doing and then do that thing incessantly, 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 um, and kind of commit to it. But I think that uh, there is wisdom in that, but I think also that you know life is a journey and uh, you have new information coming in all the time and you often have to like make radical changes in course and direction and I think it's really important to be sensitive and intuitive to the things happening around you so you can pick up on those cues and change course when you need to. So I'm going to talk about a few kind of different phases that, I, that I've gone through creatively, um, starting with my teenage years up until today. And, and each of these phases um, sort of comes with a with a kind of promise um, that it starts with. When I, I first enter into it, I think like, oh, this is going to be the thing that, that really does it. This is going to be the thing that answers all my problems, all my questions. And then inevitably, I realize that that, that promise comes with a cost, and that each of these um, phases also has a downside or a weakness. And, uh, and so it's kind of been this process of, of vacillating between idealism and um, getting those hopes um, shot a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to just talk through these five um, kind of phases, which pretty much go chronologically through through my life. So when I was a kid, I was really interested in painting and in comic books. And, and you know, the, the promise here with paint is that it's, it's incredibly beautiful, it's incredibly human, um, very rich. And uh, when I was a kid, I did um, lots of painting. This is a really awkward picture of me doing one of my first paintings, um, wearing pajama bottom cutoff pants and uh, really bad hair and braces. Um, and uh, then I got a little bit older and I started doing oil paintings. I started doing these landscape paintings, uh, like with a field easel and a beret standing out in the rain. <laughs> like, really absurd. Uh, then, um, then I started keeping these sketchbooks. I saw a show of this guy Peter Beard uh, when I was a teenager and I, he really inspired me to start keeping really elaborate sketchbooks that would record my living experience. So I would fill them with all sorts of stuff like um, uh, ticket stubs and dead plants and dead insects and watercolor paintings and writings. And they were these very personal documents that kind of um, reflected whatever I was experiencing in my life. And I would try to add a page to them every single day. And I still have um, lots of these. Uh, some of them were very, very personal. Uh, others had photography pasted in. Um, this, uh, yeah, just a bunch of stuff. And, and I loved this feeling of slowly creating something that became more and more beautiful over time, uh, this record of my life that would become more beautiful over time. And that feeling is a feeling I never had on the internet, notably. And that insight would come back later to inform some of my other later work. But I never had that feeling on the internet of slowly creating something that increased in beauty. Everything was like these quick hits that were just being thrown away. Um, so I kept these sketchbooks for about six years, and I stopped keeping them um, very abruptly in uh, 2003. I was traveling in Central America with some friends, and I was alone one afternoon in, in um, San Jose, Costa Rica, and got jumped and robbed by five people with a, like a gun on my head, and they... Um, they took a knife and cut the strap of my of my bag and took a sketchbook that had like eight or nine months of work in it. and. Uh, and it was very traumatic. I got beaten up pretty badly um, and had these sunburned blisters on my shoulders that got ripped open, so I was bleeding all over the place. And, uh, you know, it was this very traumatic experience, but it ended up being one of those things in life that is um, terrible when you're going through it, but that ends up being uh, opening into a new way of doing things, a kind of doorway into a new way of doing things. And so uh, for me, when that experience happened, I realized the cost of working with paint is that it's, it's very f fragile, very fleeting. Um, and this isn't just paint, but anything that's physical and tactile. And so I was 23 when this happened, and I made a really um, decisive shift at that point, and I turned towards data, basically, as a, as a um, creative expression mode. And uh, data has these traits that I, um, that I felt, which was that, well, no one can rob this from me. This is kind of invulnerable. And I also had this feeling when I was a kid that you could answer any question out there with data alone. And uh, it was sort of had this worldview that basically went, you know, give me enough data and then I will understand. Or give me a laptop and a web connection and I'll tell you anything you need to know about life. And uh, those are things I really no longer believe, uh, but that I believed when I was younger. And um, I think my uh, um, decreasing faith in data 
as a means of getting insights has tracked with the general society's increasing faith in data as a means of getting insights. Uh, I think data has sort of become like a, like a new pornography now, infographics in particular, and uh, I think it's actually quite limited in the insights it can give you about things. But, but I didn't know that yet, so I was, uh, I, I was a young kid. This was back in 2004. This was the first sort of data project I did called Word Count, which was a simple visualization of the 88,000 most frequently used English words as a really long sentence. Uh, then another one called 10 by 10, which was a grid of news photos automatically picked every hour based on international news coverage and 100 matching words that creates these um, photographic postcards of moments in history that you can browse all the way back to 2004, hour by hour. Uh, this one was done for Seed, um, the science magazine. It was a visualization of science news. Uh, this was a big project called We Feel Fine, which was a kind of search engine for human feelings. Uh, this one was called Universe, which was trying to come up with new constellations for the night sky based on international news coverage. Uh, and then this one was commissioned by the MoMA, um, I Want You to Want Me, about online dating. And all these projects had this basic worldview in common, which was that um, using the data footprints that people leave behind on the web, we can make really beautiful and meaningful portraits of those people and in the process get some really deep insights about human life. And I think there's some truth in that, but I think in general, um, the types of insights you end up getting through looking only at data are pretty superficial insights. And I started to feel the limitations of my own projects. I started to feel like they were not actually um, teaching me much. They were sort of things I already knew. And you, you see this a lot, like you open up the New York Times and you, you read a typical social sciences article and it'll be a headline like, you know, uh, uh, massive university collaborative study of tweets proves that people feel more tired late at night. <laughs> and you're kind of like, wow, like that's really interesting. They were able to like use tweets to discover that. But then you're kind of like, wait, I, I kind of already knew that. And and like most, you'll find that once you start looking for these things, most social, social science academic studies tend to confirm things that we already know about the world instead of delivering new insights. Um, and I had a debate with my friend Adam uh, from Seed about this, and he was saying, well, actually what, this is, what we're doing now is it's like, this is a new instrument. It's like having a new microscope and th that these studies, while superficial, they're kind of like focusing the lens. They're making sure that... Um, you know, that actually the data can confirm our intuitions, and uh, if they can confirm our intuitions, then we can start doing deeper work down the line once we've focused the instruments properly. And that's an interesting argument. So I think that there is the potential of data to maybe someday deliver some of these deeper insights, but a lot of the data stuff that you see now, nowadays in 2012, I think is relatively superficial. Um, and a lot of the infographics that, produ that are produced, and these things are so popular now, so widespread, I think a lot of these infographics now are not very interesting because the underlying data itself is not very interesting. I think good, good infographics, good data design has to begin with a secret or with an insight that you can deliver to people and that can only be revealed through the design of that data in a particular way. If you're just adding um, nice aesthetics onto something to make it look pretty, then uh, you're, you're not really delivering any kind of secret. It's sort of like taking a really boring person and uh, having them put on makeup and dress up nice, but like they're still sort of a boring person. Um, and I think a lot of uh, infographics kind of like boring person. Uh, so anyway, I started to feel with data these costs, which is that it's relatively superficial in the types of insights that you can actually deliver. And there's no journey, there's no life. I mean, the process of working with data is sitting at a desk, staring at a glowing rectangle and clicking a mouse. And that's no way to live, I think. Uh, and I started to feel like my own body was sort of atrophying and uh, I wasn't living uh, the life that I wanted to be living. And so I, in my late 20s, when I was around 27, I made a kind of shift away from data and trying to do projects that were more based in the real world. And, um, and this had this new promise, which was that this would be very vivid, this would be very rich, this would involve a lot of really beautiful experiences. And so I started designing projects that would take me to um, real world situations, really intense real world situations. The first one I did was documenting a, a whale hunt up in Barrow, Alaska um, for 10 days, taking a photograph every five minutes and then increasing that frequency when my heartbeat got fast up to about 40 photos in five minutes. So it was like sort of replacing the computer program as the means of data collection with myself as the means of da data collection. But following a similar rule set. And so I did that for 10 days, and um, it was you know, an in incredible experience. Um, we were camped out about six 
uh, miles from shore on four feet of pack ice. Um, it was incredibly cold, about 26 degrees below zero, and the sun never went down. Um, this is Simeon, the, the captain of the crew I was with. Um, the weather turned and got really ominous, and the wind died down. And uh, then, you know, they would sight a whale and go after it in the umiak and then harpoon it, and um, you'd have the whale hanging onto the edge of the ice, and then they'd build this block and tackle system with drills in the ice and haul the whale up. Uh, and then they'd have this huge kind of tug of war to get the whale out of the water. Um, so it was like the ocean and the humans competing for who was going to get to keep the whale. The people usually win. And finally, they have it up on the ice and um, start the process of cutting it up uh, into strips, which will be distributed out to the whole community and um, form the food source for most families in the town, like three or four nights a week. And uh, and at the end, this is all that's left is just one uh, jawbone. And then they, they let that um, just stay there. And then when the ice melts in the springtime, that'll fall down to the bottom of the bottom of the ocean floor and form a new ecosystem for small um, uh, bacterial life and little crustaceans and things. So anyway, I got home and I built this uh, sort of web framework to display these 3,214 pictures that I took, which are arranged chronologically here. And uh, I won't go into this. You can check out this project online, just Google the whale hunt. Um, but it's this whole kind of interactive framework for browsing uh, this data. And, uh, and then I, I liked that experience. I thought it was really rewarding. And so I designed another kind of similar project, um, this one in the Himalayas in Bhutan, really small Himalayan kingdom about the size of Vermont. And Bhutan is interesting because it's sandwiched by China and India, and it's tiny. And so they were really worried in the early 70s that they were going to get invaded. And so the king, uh, Jigme Singye Wangchuk, uh, who's pictured there with his four wives, who are all sisters, um, uh, designed this concept called gross national happiness, uh, which uh, was their sort of answer to gross domestic product. And um, this thing is marketed up the wazoo in Bhutan. They've got billboards, they've got conferences in Bangkok every year, they've got all these foreign academics employed to study the happiness of the Bhutanese people with Excel spreadsheets and surveys and this sort of thing. They take it really, really, really seriously. And I thought, like, it's happiness, like, it shouldn't be taken that seriously. Like, you know, uh, that seemed weird. So I decided to do a sort of silly project there where I would hand out balloons to people uh, and ask them how happy they were from 1 to 10 and then uh, give them that many balloons so you have like really happy people holding 10 and like really sad people holding one balloon uh, and, and I thought it would just be like silly you know <laughs> and uh, and I would ask people to make a wish to write on the balloon of their favorite color um, and so this dude here wanted to live all the monks had the same all the monks were 10 happiness and all the monks were like basically wanting to live a long life in the monastery or go a good path or this sort of thing. They were all on message, you know. Uh, and then, but then there were some really intense ones, like this girl told me she, her wish was to have been born a boy, uh, which was totally out of the blue. Um, she said that she felt like women in Bhutan didn't really have an opportunity uh, to live a good life, um, that they were always um, subservient to men, so that was her wish. This kid uh, wanted to join a school and learn to read. Uh, this guy was an old itinerant farmer, and he said he wanted to come with me, so he had somewhere to live, which was like really intense.